Hey everyone. Our topic today is hemodynamic monitoring. It's a topic that you would have imagined we would have touched on already, given our focus on caring for the critically ill and injured patient. And the reason I've held off on it is it is a surprisingly controversial area. And so I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts on resuscitation, what are the endpoints of resuscitation, how do we get there, what particular fluid do we need to use, and other important topics. As I mentioned, this is a surprisingly controversial area. So let's begin in the early 1970s with the invention of the flow-directed pulmonary artery catheter by Swan and Gans. And the concept of it is that, for those of you who don't know, it's a piece of plastic, it's a catheter inserted into the uh, internal jugular, then goes into the right atrium, into the right ventricle, then into the pulmonary artery, and there's an inflated balloon that helps guide the catheter through flow into one of the branches of the pulmonary artery, and at that point it wedges and can read left atrial and during diastole, left ventricular and diastolic pressures to help gauge a sense of preload for the left ventricle. In addition, it has a thermistor on the end of it, and using the Stewart-Hamilton equation, after an injection of saline, it can, change, it can check the change in temperature over time and give the user, the operator, a sense of the cardiac output. And in addition, using the equation that you see on the screen, P equals QR, you can solve for R um, and get a sense of both pulmonary vascular resistance and systemic vascular resistance. And so for many years, the pulmonary artery catheter and aggressive hemodynamic monitoring and management based on this hemodynamic monitoring has really helped define the field of critical care medicine. But then, over the years, and there's a large literature behind this, some of the most important articles, uh, important studies happening in early 2003, the Sandum trial, where when they've tried to look at subgroups of patients where using the pulmonary artery catheter to improve outcomes really couldn't come up with a positive result. And so the problem was this pulmonary artery catheter that, as I mentioned, helped define our field, wasn't approved in the same way that drugs are approved with head-to-head -head randomized trials. And so one of the other questions then is if, to date, there is a large amount of data that shows that the use of the pulmonary artery catheter is not associated with improved outcomes, then what? Well, there's an entire field of minimally invasive hemodynamic monitoring devices, and all of which can give more data. The, the big question that they are trying to answer is, is this patient volume responsive? And again, many of them use certain uh, algorithms looking at pulse pressure variability, systolic pressure variability, and stroke volume variability with inspiration and exhalation to help gauge that if the variability is above a certain number, usually 13 to 15 percent with inspiration and exhalation, then the patient is still volume responsive. So most units that you will work in will have some form of a minimally invasive hemodynamic monitoring device that can give you a sense of can your patient receive more fluid. In addition, if your patient has a triple lumen catheter in place, you can measure the central venous pressure. And again, this is fraught with complications. And as you might imagine, if we're really interested in left ventricular end diastolic volume and what we're measuring is right, right atrial pressure, there's going to be problems. Again, in general, if you're resuscitating a patient and their CVP is 2, low is helpful. High is not. Patients may be having a non-compliant right or left ventricle, and so it may not necessarily reflect the need for more volume. In addition, many authors point out that just because your patient may indicate that they could receive fluid 
and that they're on the steep part of the Frank Starling curve, it may not necessitate that they should receive more fluid. And so as we're heading towards the end of this brief video, I would share with you that, again, with the recent studies of the process, arise, and promise trials showing that even early goal-directed therapy is no longer mandated as part of the resuscitative approach towards a patient who is critically ill. I think things you can hang your hat on are that patients who have, for example, severe sepsis syndrome should receive early, aggressive, appropriate volume resuscitation. In general, if you look at the results of these trials, these patients usually received two, two and a half liters of fluid as part of their initial resuscitation. The point I'm trying to make is that whatever particular hemodynamic monitoring device that is used in your particular intensive care unit, you should try to understand its strengths and its weaknesses, and that you should, my recommendation is to use a global approach. Use your assessment from the physical examination. You can read about uh, straight leg raises and see how the patient's blood pressure uh, responds to lifting their legs to have them auto-infuse some fluid. You should use your hemodynamic monitoring equipment to see how well the patient responds to a bolus of fluid. And you can understand some of the strengths and limitations of pulse pressure variability, systolic pressure variability, and stroke volume variability as you're using them to help resuscitate your patient appropriately. And my recommendation and my philosophy really is a global approach. Examine the patient. If there's a central line in place, look at the central venous pressure, being aware of the limitations. If your unit has access to minimally invasive hemodynamic monitoring equipment, use it understanding some of the strengths and weaknesses of when it may be helpful, when it may not be helpful. Know that in general, these pieces of equipment are supposed to be used in patients who are intubated, sedated, and paralyzed. That they are often unhelpful in setting of certain arrhythmias. But with all of those caveats, know that they may be helpful to tell you that the patient uh, may still require more fluid. I think understanding the fundamental physiology is very important but know the strengths and limitations of whatever hemodynamic equipment you're using in your intensive care unit. Again, I end by saying that this is an important area of critical care medicine, critical care surgery, but that it's very important that you're aware that this is a complex, controversial area and that different authorities have looked at, different researchers have looked at what is the best way to resuscitate a patient who, for example, may have severe sepsis syndrome and septic shock. And the consensus in 2015, the consensus in 2015 is to stay focused on early, aggressive, appropriate resuscitation and then using a global approach, a clinical assessment, to see how your patient is responding to fluids. I would strongly recommend that you go online and look for the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines for more details in this particular area. And remember, be strong, stay focused. See you later. <laughs>